Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah and I am a geriatric social worker and I'm part of the team here at CIMI. And uh, we have a program for you of uh, several meetings or meetings that I will be joining um, the team here. And um, we want to help you do a good job. And we've prepared some, um, some uh, presentations that I'd like to go over with you. So today is going to be our first presentation. Our subject for today is culture and values in the relationship with, um, with the elderly and our client or patient as we like to refer to them to our uh, employer. And um, I'll just say that our session for today is about an hour and a half. We're going to have an intermission in about a half hour to 40 minutes. And basically these, um, these sessions are, are for your benefit. Um, we hope that they will be beneficial to you. And of course they will be more so if you choose to participate. And so I invite you and encourage you to participate. I will ask you know, for you to um, share questions, comments, experiences. And um, one of the um, goals of this, um, of this project is for you also to have some kind of a professional group that you can you know, consult with and keep in touch with. It's always important to have you know, colleagues in any kind of employment situation. And because you're here on your own, this is something that we'd like to help you establish. So first, before anything else, I just want to say welcome. And uh, welcome to our caregiving team here in Israel. And uh, we appreciate, you know, the fact that you left your home, your job, your life and family and so on, and have embarked on this adventure to care for elderly people in a different country. And I commend you for being so brave, especially during these Corona times, which make everything kind of upside down and uncertain. And so, um, yeah, welcome. So today I'm going to talk about values. I'm going to share a screen. One minute. Okay. I hope everyone can see this. And um, basic values, we all have basic values, no matter what culture or religion we're all from. And actually our basic values are one of our most important tools in our toolkit as professional caregivers. And I'll just say that, you know, the purpose of our um, talk today is to make us a little bit more aware, more sensitive and, um, and to maybe uh, more thoughtful about ourselves and the situation that we're in. And the better people we are, the more attuned we are to ourselves and to our surroundings, the more we have in our toolbox as professional caregivers. And our personality, just gonna turn the telephone off. Our personality is our main tool in, in this profession. And so we want to, you know, encourage you all to develop uh, better skills and be better people. So what does all of that involve? What are the basic values in the caregiving work? Human dignity, autonomy, tolerance, empathy, compassion, and care. All of these are big terms, big words. And we'll talk a little bit more about each one of these. What these values mean in caregiving work? Well, let's talk a little bit about human dignity. Value that refers to a person's unique as a person. Dignity is the right of a person to be valued and respected for their own sake, to be treated ethically. Respect your patient's humanity, privacy, thoughts, feelings, opinion, beliefs, and his body. Maintain your patient's privacy and dignity. I think this is, you know, just sometimes it seems, you know, common sense, but even so, it's important to, to try to talk about this a little bit. 
don't forget you're a stranger and you're coming into a person's home and you look different and you smell different and you talk different. And I think that automatically that makes you a little bit, how should I say it? Um, it makes your client, your the, you know, the home that you're in uneasy, insecure, and um, you know, a stranger is entering his private place, his secure place, the place that he has control over, and you're entering at a time in his life where he has lost control of most of the parts of his life. So basically, as much of a crisis as this minute in time is for you, it is also for them, okay, for your client and for your employer. You must understand that to, um, to have someone as a caregiver in, in your home is a very big deal. It's a crisis point in everyone in that person's life to say to themselves that, yes, I cannot function independently. I need 24-hour care and my family can't do it for me anymore. And so I have no other choice. And so I think that people usually may be a little tense, anxious, perhaps even mourning and even angry. And all of these, you know, emotions are probably part of the package. And I'm assuming that many of them, you may feel yourself as well, right? Into this kind of a situation. So first of all, the very important thing to do is to understand where your client is and what's going on in his life, okay? And perhaps they've had caregivers assist them in different aspects of their life cycle or their daily routine. Perhaps they've had people come and clean, do gardening, do, you know, do um, all kinds of other things, cooking and so on. But having a caregiver for 24 hours is really a big deal as well as for, for you and for them. So first of all, you want, to you want to maintain an essence of privacy, okay? So what does privacy mean? It means that you don't touch anything, you don't move anything, you know, um, you don't disturb their, you know, their kind of life situation as much as possible. You want to be very observant and you want to be, of course, smile a lot and um, and try to uh, pick up on the rhythm and the pace and the way that things are done in their home, okay? Because if you move things, if you change things, it makes a person very anxious, okay? People like things to be the way they are. So you want to respect your patient's humanity, okay? This is a time in his life where he is at the most difficult, okay? The most difficult time in his life and his privacy and his thoughts and his feelings, he may not express them, okay? So we have to use a lot of um, intuition and a lot of patience. And we'll talk about all of those things, how to understand what a person is feeling and what his thoughts are. And of course, if he does talk, then of course you want to listen and get to know him. And it's very important that you begin to know your employer, your client, as much as possible right from the beginning, because you're going to be accompanying him for, you know, hopefully a long time, but most likely his situation will be reduced and his abilities will be, you know, minimized over time. And so it's important that you know as much as possible about him as soon as possible, right? Because you want to be able to, um, to do good for him, right? To be able to make him calm and, and relaxed and as comfortable as possible. So it's important to know what are all of those things that make a person comfortable and relaxed and so on. Autonomy. Autonomy is the capacity to make an informed, uncoerced decision, self-directing freedom and especially moral independence. Give your patient the right to choose what he prefers to do, where he wants to go, allow him to make his own decisions. This is very important that you understand how important it is when a person has lost so much of the, 
you know, of everything in his life and being able to control anything in his life is very, very dear and, and, and important to him. And so even under deciding if he wants an egg in the morning or something else or how he wants to have the egg or when he wants to sleep or eat or bathe or what to wear, when to go out, when to stay in, all of those things are very, very important that you allow your employer to choose and make the smallest decisions as much as possible, okay? And don't assume that if because yesterday in the last 10 months, he's done the same thing that you don't need to ask him. You need to ask him and respect his ability to say yes or no, or, you know, or choose. That's very important to understand. Tolerance, big word, tolerance. Toleration is allowing or permitting an, <clears throat> an act of an act or an action, idea, an object, or a person, which one can sometimes dislike or disagree with. Be tolerant of your patient and give yourself time to grow, to know each other, even if you don't agree with him, sometimes always respect him. So, you know, being tolerant of things that are uncomfortable to us or things that we don't understand or things that we don't like is a very big part of our job, right? Because this is something that's important to our client or to our employer, to our patient. And so we want to be able to, you know, to be able to do things, even though maybe it's not exactly the way we would like to do it or how we'd like to do it at the time that we think is important to do it. But yes, being tolerant of something that goes against our brain is very important. Empathy. Empathy is the capacity to understand from another person his experience, what another person is experiencing from within his frame of reference. That is the capacity to place oneself in another's position. Definition of empathy encompasses a broad range of emotional states. Try to empathize with your patients physical and emotional condition. <clears throat> well, I think that this is important to be able to understand, you know, your patients, your employer's <clears throat> physical needs, okay? If he's in pain, what diseases cause him, uh, the, you know, discomfort or, if, or any other kind of anxiety and so on. But I think that with empathy, I, you know, it takes time to know exactly what your client is going through emotionally and psychologically, you have to understand that, you know, Israel is a young country. And most people that live in Israel that are elder, and so on have immigrated from another place. And so they've had hardships in their life. They've been strangers very much like you at one point or another in a culture. And you know, you want to know what has come, you know, what has come of their life, disappointments, tragedies, people that are gone, people that are there, important to know about that. But I think that you also have to know that, you know, it's um, empathy is important up to a point. We don't want to let their sadness or their pain um, also influence us in a way that we would, you know, be disabled by that. So yes, it's important to be empathetic, but I think it's also important to know where to put the borders of of how, you know, how to do that. And I think that a better, um, a better, um, how should I say it, characteristic that we should embrace is compassion, okay? Compassion is sympathetic pity, pity and concern for the suffering and misfortunes of others. So when we are compassionate towards our employers or the family and everyone around us, we come from strength. And we want to use our strength in order to assist them, to lift them into a, you know, a better place. So compassion is very important. Compassion motivates people to go out of their way to help physical, mental, and emotional pains of another and themselves. All of that is care. That's our, you know, that's what we do. This is our profession. Those are the tools that we take with us in our personality as caregivers, the provision of what is necessary for the care, welfare, maintenance, and protection of someone or something. And I want you to, you know, to know that the family that you're going to be um, caring for their elder or, you know, 
um, disabled person is putting a very important, um, you know, part of their life in your hands, and they will trust you to do your best to care for them and to protect them. And I think that you have to understand that that involves not just the physical aspect of that person, but also his home and everything that's in his home, right? It's all into our responsibility to care for his surroundings as well as for him. So I invite everyone to, um, to join us in a discussion. What, in your opinion, is the most important caregiving work? Are there any other values that you believe that are important for caregiving work? Would anyone like to share about some of the things that I've spoken about? I'll just say one more thing, that I think perseverance is a very important trait to add to all of our values, because perseverance means that even if a situation is difficult, we don't automatically say, this is not for me, I got to change. No, you have to weather it through. You know, if you think that the window is closed, you open a door, you see who can help you, who would be, you know, available to you, perhaps the social worker in the, um, you know, in the uh, agency, perhaps the family member, a daughter, a son, um, you know, a family friend, a neighbor. You, some of those things are, you know, very important to understand and to learn that, yes, over time you will build a support group that will help you. And to persevere means that you need to, you know, to find all the different ways to deal with difficult situations. So what do you think, guys? Anyone like to share an experience, a thought, a question, or a comment? How many people in our group today, Anna? Um, unfortunately, not a lot. Okay. And approximately, let's see. Eight or in, um, nine, ten. Okay, that's mm -hmm. a nice group. That's a nice size. Yeah. We have time to hear people and, you know, to share experiences. Yeah. Uh, Anyone like to share a thought about what I spoke about? Open your cameras, everyone, so we can see each other. So you can see each other. <laughs> Opportunity to make friends. There we go. Janice, how about you? Would you like to share something from your experience? Are you already at your employer or are you uh, somewhere else? I am here in my employer, mom. Okay, good. What city are you in? Haifa. Oh, okay. That's where Anat lives. Maybe you'll see her on the street one day. <laughs> oh, thank you, mom. <laughs> Have you worked before in caregiving abroad? Yes, ma'am. Where have you worked? In Taiwan. In Taiwan, okay. Yes, ma'am. Do you want to tell us something a little bit about that? It's the same here. <laughs> Is it? Okay. I take care of an elderly, old woman. And, and what language did you speak to her? Mandarin. Oh, and you know Mandarin. It's um, leat leat. It... A little. <laughs> a little, okay. Yeah. And I see you've learned a little bit of Hebrew as well. <laughs> yes, mom. Oh, good for you. Good for you. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else like to share? They worked abroad before. Hi, Rachel. 
Yes, hi ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, um, we are still in isolation because uh, we 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 are need, we need to isolate for seven days. Mm. Okay. I would like to share something about my experience. Um, I'm working in a home for the aged at the Philippines. So um, we are taking care of 82 elderly in a day. So I have a little um, experience about how to handle um, uh, elderly, but uh, here it's a little bit different because uh, because of the language that we don't know how to speak uh, yet, but uh, we'll try our best to, <laughs> to adjust. <laughs> Okay, so this is your first time abroad, right? Uh, by working, yes, ma'am. But uh, uh, okay. yeah, but in a other country, uh, I I went there to visit my sister. But uh, for the first time, I I work here in Israel. Okay, so I welcome yeah. you, and I'm sure you're going to have a very nice experience. And where are you going to be? In what city? Do you know? Um, a peta tekba. Again? Peta tekba. Peta tekba. Peta tekba. Okay, that's a nice yes. place. Yes, I hopefully um, I, I will see my employer this coming Wednesday. And uh, I, I, I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, excited also. Because um, maybe I'm expecting to, to try to extend my help and care for someone. Okay. Okay. What do you know about your employer? Um, the only thing I know about her is uh, she's eighty four years old, and uh, she has um, uh, she's diabetic and uh, has an Alzheimer's. Um, okay. since uh, I work in the Home for the Aged Philippines, so I have a little bit idea about it on how to handle those kind of patients. <laughs> But I'm still willing to learn more and more. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm sure good. you're going to do a good job. And yes, that being a, being a uh, caregiver for an Alzheimer patient is a challenging position. But, yes. Um, okay, good. Anyone yeah. else? I can see that the Marisa sent a message okay. on the chat. What did she right? Caregiving should be more patients in their patient. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Nariza, that's a nice, that's a very nice thought. Have you worked abroad before? Not yet, ma'am. This is my first time to work abroad. Mm. So this but is I'm a little... working as a caregiver in the Philippines. Okay. Okay. So this is going to be an adventure for you. And where are you going yes, to be stationed? In what city? Uh, Tel Aviv, in Castel Aviv. Oh, wow, that's a great place to be. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully. Oh, yeah, Hopefully. Lots, of lots of action on those streets. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Nechi? Is that how you pronounce your name? Nechi, Nechi? Oh, yeah. How do you say your name? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, guys. So I'll hello, just hello. say hello. Hello, hello ma'am. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. This is Nechi, ma'am. I'm sorry. Nechi. Okay. <laughs> yes, I wasn't ma sure if I was pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, okay. ma'am, Nechi. You're correct, ma'am. <laughs> is this your first time abroad? Yes, ma'am. This is my first time. Okay. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm scared, but I'm so excited. Okay. That's very natural. You know, you know, being scared and excited is good. So first thing I have to tell you, everyone, got to smile a lot. A lot. Got to smile a lot. Okay, even when you're anxious, one of the caregivers in a previous um, uh, presentation shared with us that at first she was so anxious and scared, 
that she she didn't smile and her employer thought that she was you know mean and <laughs> and, and the strict so you, first thing you got to do is you know no matter what smile a lot to smile yes <laughs> okay. mom <laughs> okay first thing and most important thing is to smile a lot okay you can't be strict and mean if you smile a lot Okay, everyone. Yes, Anat, do you want to say something before we take a little break here? Just that we all see you in five minutes. Five minutes, guys. We'll be back. Okay. Thank you. You don't have to. It's fine. Well, so we're back. And um, I hope everyone is back with us. So I want to talk about a few more important subjects today. Um, gender aspects and caregiving work. I think this is very important. I, uh, today's group is mostly ladies, right, Anna? No gentlemen with us today? Exactly. Okay. All ladies. Only the apples. apples. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so first of all, I just want to tell you, you know, I don't know if you, what you've heard about Israel and uh, in general, you know, living in the Middle East and so on, but you'll eventually you'll learn many things. I'll just say that in General, it's a safe place to be, okay? Uh, big cities and everywhere else, it is a safe place to be for women, okay? Um, and um, it would be nice if you turned your mics off, ladies, unless you want to speak, because uh, all the other noises make background that's not pleasant. Okay, good. So um, I'll just say again that Israel is a safe place, okay? In the, it gets dark early now. You can see it's, you know, like not even five and it's been already dark for quite a while. And it is safe to walk around even in the dark. Uh, streets are lit. Everywhere is, you know, with cameras. Um, you really shouldn't feel uncomfortable about your personal safety. But I say this again, but, um, you know, you have to use uh, common sense. You don't want to be in a dark alley uh, after midnight in a place that's deserted, right, uh, alone, and you don't know where you're going and how you'll get there. This is something that I don't recommend to do. So, you know, if you need to go somewhere, even if it's late at night, that's fine. Know beforehand how you're going to get there, that you have enough money to use a cab or a bus or whatever, no hitchhiking, and best not to be alone in dark, strange places at night, okay? This is like all over the world, nothing has changed. But otherwise, you shouldn't feel uncomfortable about your personal safety. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is gender aspect and caregiving work. So I'll just say again, briefly and in general, that, you know, we're all men, women, but today it's modern to think of, um, of gender and a spectrum of, you know, from one end to the next. And uh, many people can identify of being a little bit, not exactly one gender or another, and that's fine. Israel is a very tolerant country, respectively. But, you know, our um, employers, patients are probably very conservative. And so there are certain aspects of your life and so on that you would want to perhaps not be very, making very obvious. And then there's other aspects of work that, you know, in terms of being a man or a woman that we should be taking into consideration. So a few facts about gender and care work, although most of the caregivers are women, there are also many men who are caregivers, especially when a man needs to be cared for. Some of the female caregivers provide care for a man or live in a home where a man lives. And some of the male caregivers provide care for a woman or live in a home where a woman may live. So first of all, I want you to be minded about the fact that um, if you are caring for a couple or if there are, other, there are family members you know, that are of a different sex than what you, than what you are yourselves or you're caring for someone of a different sex, you should be minded of the fact that you are young, you're good looking, you're vibrant, you have energy, and that may arouse all kinds of feelings in your employer or other people in his family, whether it's a husband or a wife. 
And you should be minded about that and also know how to deal with that, okay? Sometimes if you're touching a person in an intimate way, bathing them, clothing them, talking to them in a soft, gentle way, perhaps rubbing their hand or foot or helping them, you know, when they're bathing, whatever. And they, you know, and they feel that this is, um, you know, it connects to a, a sexual kind of uh, situation where in fact it isn't. And so it's important that you know how to respond and put guidelines to that, okay? And say, no, this is not the intention and so on. And also to be aware that sometimes, you know, unexpectedly people may have negative feelings also, perhaps jealousy or, you know, oh, she smiles at them. She, you know, my husband is smiling at her. He hasn't smiled at me in 10 years. Oh, she's cooking better. She's cleaning better. She's whatever. You know, sometimes even negative feelings arrive, even though they're waiting for your help, they need your help, they're anxious and and so on, but unexpectedly, some situations may lead to unexpected negative feelings. So you must be very sensitive and observe and try to understand, you know, how people are responding to you and you're, you're all young and energetic. And so this in itself changes the dynamics of a situation in a family and you want to know how to deal with things, okay? Not to be afraid, but to know how to deal with things. How does gender contribute to the caregiving relationship? Although women usually take care of children and adults, <clears throat> spouses and other family members, there are also men who have these abilities. Women naturally have the ability to care for others with empathy, compassion, concern, and love. But men can also have good caregiving abilities, and some men like to take care of their family or work in the care field. Your caregiving qualities are an asset. Be proud of them and use your caregiving abilities to provide good quality care. And again, I want to emphasize that under no circumstances should you be um, tolerant of any kind of behavior or being approached on a sexual uh, manner that is uncomfortable to you or that is inappropriate to your work situation, okay? Um, this is not tolerate, tolerated and you should not tolerate it, but you need to know how to deal with it and you don't need to be alone in the situation. If you find yourself in this kind of a situation, whether your employer or someone else in his family approaches you in an inappropriate sexual manner, and you don't, you know, and you can't figure out how to deal with it yourself, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. You can consult other people in the family, son, daughter, husband, or wife, and also the social worker in the, um, um, you know, in the company that you are, uh, that you have been um, employed by, okay? This is very important that you share these kind of things, not to be alone with them. Sometimes people don't know how to respond. And so they're quiet. They kind of look down. They're embarrassed. This is not the right way to deal with the situation. You look a person in the eye and you'll say, no, this is inappropriate. This is not the intention. And you share that situation with other people and around you. Gender issues. When treating a man or being close to a patient or a spouse, sexual harassment can occur. It's important to be aware of it. And here are a few tips how to deal with sexual harassment. So here is the YouTube presentation that you are invited to you know, check out if you have some spare time and perhaps it has some good tips on how to deal with this kind of a situation. Not necessarily will happen. You know, I don't wanna <laughs> put you under stress for you know, difficult situations. But I want you to be clear that this is something that is not tolerated by anyone, okay? And it's and very important that you share about it if you do encounter this. So again, I invite you to share and talk to us, talk with each other. Do you have any concerns about being a man or a woman caregiver? Do you think caregiving work is easier for a man or for a woman and why? And you think that caregiving care will be harder or easier because you're taking care of a man 
or of a woman. So I will just ask another question. Has anyone uh, cared for a person of the opposite sex before and how did they deal with that? Go ahead, Judith, we're listening. Good mm, afternoon, mom. Hi. Uh, before when I was working home for the Asian in Manila, I was I was wor I, I'm working with uh, eight bunch of girls, uh, old ladies. But here in here in Israel, my employer was a a boy. And for me, uh, it depends on how you handle your situation. If if like for example uh, if you have a kind of uh, kind of harassment to your patient maybe you will be correspond to the to the authority i think but for me for my 3 days i spend time with them and i think he's nice and their family are also nice okay how old is the boy uh 82 years old Oh, so he's not a boy. He's an old man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's an old man, rather. He's a man. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you just said something very important, that um, it's his family that's around him as well. So you're not really alone in any kind of a situation. And that's important that you already see that, okay? That the family is nice. And um, if they brought a young woman to care for an older man, um okay they assume that um this is the best you know that this is the best way to to uh to help him and um you know sometimes they you know family asks for a man to take care of a woman and sometimes they ask for a woman to take care of a man and um and you know that's fine that's absolutely fine but if you do have to deal with any kind of difficult situations. Is he a big man? Yes. Okay, do you have any concerns about being able to care for him physically? Uh, he is, he's still able to work, like he has only have a problem to his eyesight. Okay, okay, so you don't need to physically um, lift him or anything. Yes. Okay. Okay, so that's good. And um, does he speak English? Yes, he speaks English and he is a journalist here in Haradar. Okay, so it'll be a very interesting experience for you to learn many things from him as well. Yes. Okay, that sounds like a good deal. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Would anyone else like to share something about, you know, caring for someone of a different sex than themselves? Okay, so we continue to the next subject, an intercultural encounter. Intercultural differences are difference in traditions, foods, norms, beliefs, values, which vary between nations, ethnic groups, speakers of different languages. Every culture has its own way of expressing itself. Every culture has its own ways of defining conflict, passing messages, resolving conflict, and talking about it. Every culture has its own ways to express emotions, and to talk about emotions. So I think, you know, everyone is experiencing this, you know, in the beginning very acutely and perhaps a little later, less so. Yeah, this is a different, um, a different kind of a culture that you, you know, that you are um, used to. Uh, Asia is, um, is, you know, North, South, East, West, whatever. And uh, the Middle East is a whole different can of beans, we say in English, in American <laughs> jargon. And um, smells, tastes, sounds, rhythm, 
yeah, it's all very different. And I uh, will just say that, first of all, um, about care, Israel has a very good uh, health system that you will learn about. Hopefully you won't need it for yourself, but you are part of it. And you um, are insured like everyone else in one of the um, health groups. And if you are in need of any kind of apparatus or mechanism or tools or anything that will assist you in caring for your employer in a better way, then it's all readily available at almost no cost, if, if at all. So this goes back a little bit to, you know, caring for someone of a different sex or someone bigger, even of the same sex and so on. So all of those things are available. And, um, you know, you'll have to consult the family, of course, and how to, how to get them, but it's not an issue, okay? It's not a problem and they're not expensive and so on. And so you shouldn't have any problems with, you know, moving, uh, lifting, shifting, bathing, all of the apparatus that's available, you know, in the world is available for you. And back to culture. Um, yeah, you look different, you smell different, you talk different, you sound different. And as far as you're concerned, everything here is all different than, you know, what you're accustomed to. So I will firstly say that my name is Sarah, not ma'am. And in Israel, there, we are very informal. And we call people on our first name. Even children in school call the teachers by their first name. And even uh, the principal, they call by the first name. And um, <laughs> whether it's good or not, I don't know, but this is how it is. And, um, and you should ask your employer how he wants to be called, okay? Don't assume that they want to be called Ima or Abba, which is, you know, father and mother and grandma and grandpa. Uh, perhaps they'd prefer to be called by their first name. This is how usually people are referred to in Israel. And, um, yeah, and we're probably a lot louder and less uh, polite than you may have experienced in other places. And people are very direct in the way that they approach you. And they usually say what they think. And uh, even though it may seem aggressive to you, um, this is just the way they are. This is how people communicate on a regular basis, you know, if you're outside, you know, in the family. It depends, but I'm just saying that, you know, if you're out in the street, if you're on the bus, if you're on public transportation, if you're, you know, in a marketplace and you see, you know, loud talking with a lot of hand gestures and body movement and so on. Yeah, this is probably just the way people communicate with a lot of pathos and energy. Um, in terms of um, dealing with conflict and uh, resolving conflict and passing messages, I think that also has a lot to do with personality. And also it of course depends on, you know, uh, some people are angry very silently and some people are angry very loudly. So <laughs> you will have to learn how your client is and um, pick up on the small cues um, that are, uh, you know, uh, relevant to his personality and to the way the, you know, the people in that family uh, relate to each other. Okay, this is a very important cue. Um, what else can we say about culture? How to adjust to a new culture. Be patient, give yourself time. It's important that you keep your culture, customs and traditions. A few tips about adjusting to a new culture, you can also watch on this YouTube presentation, okay? I'll just say that this is a month of holidays for, you know, most religions. I'm assuming that um, you also will be celebrating in the end of November or during December and the beginning of January holidays. We also as Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah, and you'll probably be celebrating Christmas and New Year's and perhaps other holidays in your culture. So very important to, you know, learn about the holidays that, you know, your family celebrates, that your employer, I mean, and also share about the holidays that you celebrate, okay? Very important, an opportunity to learn about, about each other. 
so what have you heard about Israel and Israeli culture? Do you have any concerns about adjusting to Israeli culture, about religious issues, political issues? Do you have any questions about Israel that you'd like to ask? This is a, you know, a good opportunity to do so. Anyone? Um, hello, ma'am. I, hello. Sorry. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Michelle. Um, uh, you mean, ma'am, uh, if I need something like a, like um, working gloves or um, BP apparatus, stethoscope, so we just tell our employer to have that to, to help monitor their um, health? Well, you know, I think that I don't know. I don't know what you know about who your employer is, but um, uh, working gloves is not an issue. You know, those you can, you know, your employer will uh, will provide you with anything that you need: gloves, soap, water, you know, food, anything that you need, especially if it's for caring for your, you know, client, but or patient. But uh, a stethoscope um, is, you know, probably something that you would not need unless you are a certified doctor, you know, or whatever. Um, I, I don't know. I'm assuming that if you need it and you know how to use it and it would be a, you know, an essential uh, tool in caring for him, then perhaps yes. But I, I can't imagine that you would. Um, you know, I just want to say that each family has quite a different expectation from, you know, from the caregiver that would be coming. One family may only want you to, you know, just to be there, I would say is the minimum, just to be there, to have eyes and ears and to assist in a minimal way. And another family may expect you to, you know, to be everything and everybody, you know, uh, <laughs> and the employer himself also. So this is something that needs to be negotiated, you know, what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate is taking care of the house and, um, and cooking and cleaning and bathing and washing and caring for, you know, um, physical um, difficulties. Is it possible to do everything or perhaps not? Is it, it you know, it's something that's on a, on a negotiating scale between you and the family it isn't something that's black and white okay sometimes you know people like to take care of the house the house is you know could be including the garden and and the car and other things and sometimes only the room you know it really is uh, um how should i say it's something that needs to be to be discussed okay and also it's it's, it doesn't have to be, um, how should I say it, in the beginning, black and white, it could be changed over time, right? So if, if it's too much, or if it's too little, you know, it all depends. So over time, things that may seem difficult in the beginning will not be difficult and seem things that, you know, that you don't see now may become difficult over time. So it's just, you know, something that, that will take time to figure out what's right for them and for you, okay? Um, so it, uh, it means, ma'am, that uh, the things that we are, doing, uh, we are going to do is um, uh, uh, purely taking care of the, uh, the employer. Because uh, in, the, in the home for the age that I was working is uh, we need to monitor their blood pressure, their, their temperature once in, at, once in a day. So if uh, I, I bring my stethoscope, my, my uh, BP apparatus for, I thought that that's the part of my job. But anyway. <laughs> you don't know, you know, if your job just may be to, you know, to a company, I don't know what you know about your employer already, but it just mm -hmm. may be to just be there and smile a lot and that, yeah. you know, <laughs> and not do any of those things. Yes. So thank you. So it it really does depend. And um, okay. Um, it's not like you know. It's not a. I'm. 
I can't tell you what your position, your specific position will be. And I'm sure it's going to change over time, right? But uh, the fact that you have those skills and you have those tools in your, you know, in your case, that will probably be wonderful if you need them. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else like to ask a question about anything? Okay. You all know that in Israel, um, public transportation uh, in general stops um, just before sunset in on um, Friday and begins um, uh, on Saturday after sunset, right? And so this is how um, public transport transportation is in Israel, okay? That's how we observe the, the Sabbath. And in large cities, probably there's alternative transportation like taxis and cabs and shared cabs and so on. And um, smaller places, uh, probably not. Um, stores are also open, usually, um, you know, closed on Saturday, but sometimes there are, you know, 24 hour supermarkets that do provide the service for people that haven't prepared ahead of time. Um, yeah, you're going to learn about the routine of the employer and what his needs are and write things down and it's okay to make mistakes. And, um, and eventually, you know, you'll know how to do your job as best as possible. Would anyone else like to ask a question or share something? Hello, mom. I have Hi. some questions. Nachi, go ahead. Um, mom, how about if uh, we? If I didn't meet my employer yet, but I don't know also if he's uh, she is a religious person. But what if she is a religious person, mom? Uh, when I start to work there. Uh, are they going to tell me uh, what I need to do or the do's and don'ts, the roles well, in the house? Well, you know what? I would say that um, I hope they do. But, you know, um, they know that you're not Jewish. And so they know that you know nothing about do's and don'ts. So yes. it's a mutual responsibility to learn all the do's and don'ts. Um, you know, for them, sometimes... People that live in a certain kind of a lifestyle, you know, things are obvious. And so to you, nothing is obvious. So you, you don't be shy and write things down and ask all the questions that you need to ask, you know, whatever they don't tell you and you're not sure, ask and ask again with a smile. Okay, mom. <laughs> ask again. I'll just say, you know, I'll just say one thing, you know, you, I'm sure you all know that Jewish people have issues about food, right? There are dietary laws about milk and meat and so on. And people that observe the Sabbath do turn on the light and don't turn on the light and all those things. So it's very important just to ask, okay, and not to be insulted. I just want to tell you that the kitchen in many homes, not even if you're Jewish or not, but you know, most people in the kitchens are very sensitive. This is the way they're, you know, lots of housewives, this is their sacred spot. And uh, to have somebody else move around things in their kitchen is a big deal. And even more so in a kosher kitchen. So mm -hmm. first of all, don't be insulted, okay? If they tell you don't touch, don't put things here, don't put things there, um, you know, your food, when you eat, what you eat, you know, until they trust that you know, and, um, you know, how to behave in their kitchen, it, it's just a matter of time, okay, and of course, you're going to learn, so if they ask you not to put your food in there, and not to touch this or that, it's fine, don't, don't be insulted, it just takes time until they, they trust you to do things the way they like them done, that's all. Thank um, you, and, you know, no two religious people are the same. They're all different. So 
I can't give you any <laughs> any tips on how to do things. It's just a matter of, you know, even in my own kitchen, I know I don't like anybody moving around in it. It's my place. <laughs> so yes, my, kids, my children come, first thing they do is they open their refrigerator. What's there? What there isn't? What the <laughs> Okay, you're going to be sharing a lot of situations, okay, the refrigerator and the kitchen and the bathroom, perhaps. And, you know, you must be sensitive and minded, you know, in Israel, um, most families, because we have so much sun, most family ha have um, solar heaters. And so most of our hot water almost all year long is by the sun. And so there are certain times that uh, we have a lot of hot water and certain times that we don't. In the winter, probably less. We don't have much of a winter here, but even so. So, you know, don't be insulted or, or anxious about the fact that they tell you now you can't take a shower, now you can't take a shower. You know, uh, people don't want to, um, yeah, it may seem silly, but don't be insulted. All of those little things are important when you're living with someone, right? Yes, um, well. Okay, use a lot of water. Don't use a lot of water. Old people have, you know, all these things about them. <laughs> and you must be also sensitive about smelling, okay? Um, yeah, you know, your spices smell different to them and their spices smell different to you. And sometimes people are offended by smells. And so you don't be offended. You just be, you know, sensitive to what's going on. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Anyone else want to talk about something? Ask a question. So, Anat, do you have anything else you'd like to share with us today? Um, yes, um, just a little bit, some information. Um, all the links that you saw on the presentation, uh, I will send it uh, after the meeting. And later on, or maybe tomorrow, I will send the recorded, uh, the recording of today's meeting. Tomorrow, we will meet again. I will send you the link uh, for, the, for the Zoom meeting tomorrow. I just like to check quick because I'm not sure I forgot what time it is. Unless I Sarah, think tomorrow, know? yes, tomorrow we're meeting at 9.30. Um, so I'm not at 9.30 9 or 9.15? Mm -hmm, 9.30. Yeah, all right. So tomorrow at 9.30, exactly. And I will... Uh, remind you about half an hour before but please uh, don't be late although as long as you're here that's wonderful <laughs> I'm glad to see you and of course we here for any other questions that you may have I'm available on the Viber group all right everyone so have a nice evening well, Yes, ma'am. See you evening. tomorrow. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye, ma'am. Thank, ma Thank, ma Thank, ma Thank, ma Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.